Good evening and welcome to tonight's program hosted by the Committee of 100 and the Commonwealth Club Silicon Valley. My name is Dennis Wu. It is my pleasure to introduce Kai-Fu Lee, Chairman and CEO of Sinovation Ventures and author of AI Superpowers, China, Silicon Valley, and the New World Order. Dr. Lee has been at the forefront of AI development for 30 years. He was the president of Google China and also held executive positions of Microsoft, SGI, and Apple. He received his bachelor's degree in computer science from Columbia University and his PhD from Carnegie Mellon University. Dr. Lee has authored 10 U.S. patents and in 2013 was selected as one of the 100 most influential people in the world by Time Magazine. Moderating this evening's program is the Honorable Michelle Lee, former Under Secretary of Commerce and Director of the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Michelle was also the Herman Plager Visiting Professor of Law from 2017 to 2018 at Stanford University, where she taught a course on artificial intelligence and the novel legal, policy, and ethical issues posed by such technology. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Kai-Fu Lee and Michelle Lee. I'm taking this one. You're taking the other one. The other one, okay. Thank you, Dennis. So, good evening, everyone, and welcome. I am Michelle Lee, and I have the pleasure of being your moderator this evening. Let me. Thank you to the Commonwealth Club and also the Committee of 100 for putting on tonight's program titled Artificial Intelligence and how it will change our future. We have the good fortune of having Dr. <coughs> Kai-Fu Lee, one of the most respected AI experts and also author of the just published book, AI Superpowers, China, Silicon Valley, and the New World Order. We will be discussing the contents of this book this evening. But before I begin, allow me to set the table a little bit. Artificial intelligence, or AI, the desire to replicate human cognition has captured the imagination of mankind since antiquity. It began with myths and stories, followed later on by books and movies of artificial beings, sometimes in the form of robots, endowed with intelligence or consciousness by their creators. The modern day AI field traces its roots back to 1956, Dartmouth College at a workshop held. There, a group of computer scientists began discussing the possibility of building an electronic brain. Many predicted that a machine as intelligent as a human being could be created within a generation. Well, it's 2018, more than a generation since 1956, and that hasn't quite yet happened. That said, within the past several years, there has been tremendous excitement over the developments in artificial intelligence and also the promise that it holds. And there's a sense that we are at the cusp of some incredible consequential changes to our lives brought about by artificial intelligence in decades. So with that, Dr. Kai-Fu Lee, I'd like to ask you my first question. <laughs> What's the big deal now versus, say, a couple of decades ago when you were doing uh, AI research at Carnegie Mellon and I was a graduate student at the MIT AI lab, and AI was supposed to revolutionize the world? What's different now versus then? Okay. Thank you, Michelle, and thanks to uh, C100 and the Commonwealth Club. It's my pleasure to be here. Uh, this time is really different. Uh, AI has had its ups and downs, but this time there's a dramatic difference. That is, the amount of data 
that we're now generating is many orders of magnitude more than we had, not only compared to the 50s, let's just compare to my own PhD thesis. Um, in 1988, I published the world's best speech recognition system. That paper was built on the world's largest speech database, and we had 100 megabytes of data. <laughs> it's like five songs on your uh, iPhone, right? <laughs> but that's, I mean, we forget, but that's how much um, memory, storage, and CPU have progressed over the last 30 years. So we literally, I mean, people cannot do good um, speech research without at least one or two T of data. The best companies have 100 T. So this is one million times more data. And what happens is when you have that much more data, you also look at the algorithms I use and you laugh at it and you say, well, with that much data, you can surely train a much more complex system. So more data, uh, encourage people to develop new algorithms, then more data and better algorithms. And that led to about uh, 10 years ago, uh, a number of researchers uh, invented what's called uh, deep learning. And that is currently the type of machine learning that can use the largest amount of training data. It can have thousands of layers of neurons with connections trained on 100T of data. And that combination really made AI uh, just work so much better. But keep in mind, this is not what we originally talked about, what Michelle talked about in 1956. Um, John McCarthy and others dreamed, and also what I dreamed when I started AI, that we would build a, a, not a human brain. The AI today is very interesting. It is like a precocious super uh, brain, but it only does one thing. It's trained on huge amounts of data, but each AI algorithm can only do one thing, such as play Go, decide whether to give you a loan, target ads, um, maximize users' time on news feeds, and things like that. So we now have many companies, each of which doing one AI, which is really super smart and better than people, but it has nowhere the human capacity of common sense, reasoning, planning, strategy, and creativity. Let's look into the future. Uh, look through your crystal ball and give us a sense of the changes that AI will bring to our lives. Um, in your book, uh, Kaifu, you give a very good example and you paint for us what my grocery shopping experience will look like in mm -hmm. the future with AI. You also discuss China's AI city. Yeah. Share with the audience what lies ahead. Okay, I, I, I can generally divide AI uh, progress based on the steep learning technology in four waves. And those waves are overlapping. So, uh, some are already at maturity, others are just beginning. Um, I would say the first wave is clearly the internet wave. That is the Amazon, Google, Facebook accumulating so much internet data. And uh, what you may not realize is you're labeling and tagging data that trains the AI system. Right? You never went in and tagged the data, but by clicking or not clicking, buying or not buying, you are helping the AI make inferences on what you want and don't want. And it's able to use those inferences on all the users. So the internet data is the, by far the largest, and the world's leaders in internet AI would be those companies from the US that I mentioned, plus uh, China's Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent. And more data makes more powerful AI, makes more money, gets more users, and buys more machines, and the cycle continues. So that will continue. There will be more internet AI companies that first gather a lot of usage and then use that to help it make money. The second wave are the businesses. Um, I see many of you may be owners of businesses or executives at businesses today. Uh, the companies that you have, the, what you used to keep uh, basically your cost center, right? The bank keeps its data, hospital, insurance company. They're actually gold mine that can now be used into your business process to make, make money and save money. For example, a bank kept all the transactions of a customer and that used to be just an archive. But today, that data can be used to estimate the customer's net worth, what kind of products they might want to buy, 
and also how, whether when they apply, apply for a loan, whether to approve or not, whether a credit card transaction might be fraudulent or not, based on training from all that data. So suddenly, a lot of the data that was archived and collected can be used in a big data sense. That's the second class, the second wave. The third wave is when AI actually has eyes and ears that it can see and hear and actually understand uh, to some extent. And the best examples in the US are Amazon Echo that you can talk to uh, in your speech. And speech uh, interaction will be uh, more and more popular in more and more places. And also Amazon Go is the other example, a store in which there are no people. It's an autonomous store that has cameras and sensors that watches what people do. So when you take things and put it in your basket or even in your purse or pocket, it recognizes that and charges your account accordingly. So that kind of automation will hit many, many areas. I can imagine there will be autonomous schools. Uh, not the teacher will not be there, but uh, AI can help uh, grade papers, exams, figure out what each student may need help. Just like Google understands you from all the products it has, uh, in the future, the student will also have a profile, just like a user has a Google profile. And that profile will know everything about the student, what you might need to improve, what areas you didn't understand, what kind of teacher you prefer, whether you need tutoring, how you did on your last exam, where, um, what are your strengths and weaknesses, how do you improve. And in fact, we just did a segment with 60 Minutes. Hopefully, you'll see it in about a month. It will air and show the types of uh, AI that the companies we invest in are injecting into education. So the third wave will be basically using, it's basically uh, digitizing the physical world and capturing all kinds of information and using that to create applications that weren't before possible. Then the fourth wave is when AI becomes autonomous. That means uh, it can move. It has equivalent of our legs, arms, hands. It can move and manipulate and that will come in the form of uh, robots, from industrial robots that uh, uh, basically replace people on the assembly line to commercial robots that might be security uh, or receptionist uh, or courier to uh, uh, also in, in, in cases like restaurants, uh, dishwashing robots. In agriculture, most of what's done in agriculture, like picking fruits or um, uh, uh, spreading uh, insecticides or um, fertilizing, those can all be done with robots. And eventually in our home with education and other robots that will take care of our, cho our chores. So each of these four waves, I think over time, will generate on the order of 10% increase to the world's GDP. And it will also probably displace on the order of 10% of human jobs. So that's the positive and negatives that come together. 10% both ways. R roughly speaking, yeah. Right. Um, let's step <coughs> back, Kaifu, to the internet AI. Mm -hmm. You talked about the key to delivering powerful internet AI algorithms or solutions is the data. Doesn't that mean that large companies with huge databases of data have a competitive advantage? And what about the small startup? or the late entrant to the game? How can they compete in that space? Right, uh, I think the large companies definitely have an advantage because of the virtuous cycle that I described. So in the past, monopolies are maintained because you have a, a unique resource, brand, or customer affinity, or perhaps you have a great technology, or you have a big barrier of entry for your competitors. But today, AI and data becomes another monopoly maintenance tool. I mean, large tech companies don't want to talk about it, but this is quite powerful. Imagine a new company that has even the resources, capabilities, technologies to do what Google, Amazon, or Facebook does, but they cannot enter the market and beat the incumbent because the incumbent has accumulated all that data that has fed its AI and built its product to be more accurate and better monetized. So new entrants will have a hard time, in particular with respect to uh, internet businesses. 
although, as Michelle said, the good news, there's good news. Good news is the internet giants can't cover everything. There's no real advantage for the internet giants to rebuild a retail, our schools, our hospitals, because all of these things, as I mentioned to you, as AI has eyes, ears, and hands, and legs, uh, and can move, um, those are brand new areas and commercial applications, or agriculture, or the future of hospital, or autonomous vehicles. Even though Google happens to be ahead in autonomous vehicles, it has no real edge in terms of launching those vehicles, because it doesn't have an Uber-like business unit, or a um, General Motors-like business unit. So because the internet business is very large and valuable, but the only uh, a slice of the pie of the entire economy. So the startups that we fund and the startups that are in Silicon Valley still have great opportunities to target um, those areas that are non-internet. Non so it's not as uh, terrible as the first part sounds. Not too late. So if AI development were a baseball game, are we at the first inning, the ninth inning, or the fourth inning? Um, I think we're in the first inning. But sometimes it feels like we're in the fifth inning <laughs> uh, because there's too much hype and bubble and expectations. Uh, but I think we're just at the very beginning. So it's not too late for those companies out there no. to jump in. Let's change subjects for a moment now. Let's talk about the United States and China. Sure. And in particular, um, the title of the book is AI Superpowers, China, Silicon Valley, and the New <clears throat> World Order. What is the state of AI technology in the United States versus China, and which of these two superpowers is the greater superpower now and in the future? Right. I bet that's what's on everybody's mind. Well, you did title uh, the book, as you yes, did. I did. <laughs> and I think President Trump's speech in the UN yeah. <laughs> exacerbates yeah. the, yeah. <laughs> the issue today. Uh, I'm going to give a two-part answer. First, I will answer it, and then I will describe why that's not the right way to look at it. Um, today, U.S. is ahead, clearly, in research. Um, the top schools in the U.S. are way ahead of China, and China has no chance of catching up in 15, 20 years. That's the state of research. However, in the state of implementation, I would argue China has already roughly caught up with the U.S. and is probably going to leap ahead in the next five years. And, and that has actually just really happened in the last two years. So this would sound incredible to you that such research depth, why does it not lead to implementation advantage? And the reason is um, really twofold. One is that Chinese entrepreneurs and engineers are incredible. They may not be as deep in writing papers, thinking creative thoughts, but they're very fast learning new ideas, finding every opportunity to make money, and building operational excellence. And that's a lot of more detail in the book. Um, later, maybe I can give an example. Um, and the other part is that China has so much data. And as I mentioned earlier, AI works better with more data, and a lot better with a lot more data. So in the age of AI, um, data is the new oil, and China is this new Saudi Arabia. And, and, <laughs> And that is a little bit of an unfair advantage. And those the two things combined together makes China better in implementation. But I, w I do want to um, uh, refute myself for a moment, because I really don't think it is a zero-sum game. Uh, this, this competition of who's winning, who's losing, um, it's not like in the old days of war, where there's one piece of land to grab, or one, one, uh, a finite amount of oil to win. Uh, U.S. wants better lives for American people. China wants better life for Chinese people. These two are not at a zero-sum game. Both can succeed and win without hurting the other. Um, also, also the, two, the two China and U.S. pillars don't even intersect. Uh, I describe in my book their parallel universes. The Chinese VCs fund Chinese companies build products for Chinese people, and America the same. 
the two parallel universes don't cross. See, all the media is asking me, will Google succeed in China? Will they be allowed in? Are there uh, censorship or regulation issues? Those are not the issue. The issue is, at this point, um, the two parallel universes are, are so um, completed that companies can't cross over to the other parallel universe. So whether or not those regulations are or are not important, um, the parallel universes cannot be crossed. Uh, Alibaba cannot be successful in the US, and uh, Facebook cannot be successful in China, even if laws and regulations were a non-issue. User habits are very much fixed. Similarly, Ch AI companies will be the same. And then going beyond the US and China, Obviously, U.S. companies will lead in all developed countries. Uh, China will probably catch up in other parts of the world, as including Southeast Asia, uh, Islamic countries, because those are two regions U.S. largely ignores, and of course, Africa. So I think we'll end up actually with two, the world divided into two parts, each using different stacks of technologies. So they don't really compete in a zero-sum game, the winning of one one set of companies is not the loss of another. Uh, so I, I don't think this uh, war metaphor is, is ideal. Interesting. Let's turn to now the difference of opinions uh, in advances in AI and <clears throat> where it will take us. There are at least two camps. One view is that AI will bring us to utopia, where human beings can not work at all, or perhaps work fewer hours, and yet enjoy a heightened standard of living. There's another view, uh, supported by some prominent business people and scientists, who believe that AI presents this existential threat to humanity. Elon Musk mm -hmm. is quoted as saying, AI presents the biggest risk uh, that our civilization faces. And Stephen Hawking agrees. Which is it? Utopia? Dystopia? And how can we guide it in the direction mm -hmm. of utopia? Okay, very big question. <laughs> I think both camps have some valid points, uh, but I do want to first dispel a few uh, incorrect, uh, um, incorrect uh, parts. Uh, there are many dy dystopians and some utopians who project that singularity will happen. Probably you've heard it, right? Singularity, super intelligence, AI will exceed humans and perhaps become uncontrollable, and that's the existential risk. Uh, in, in my, I strongly believe there is absolutely no basis for that. And as someone who's worked on the engineering and product aspect, I know how limited AI algorithms are, and there's no, no reason to project that kind of capability and what that may bring about, whether it's utopia or dystopia. That's not to say it can never happen, never say never, right? You know, a thousand years ago, people wouldn't have projected that we could put um, people on space or have airplanes that fly, but those inventions were made. But I'm just saying at this point, we have no engineering evidence to make those projections, so it's basically a waste of time. However, um, AI may bring some existential risks in the following ways. Um, suppose half the jobs are wiped out and uh, people fall into depression. Um, suppose many countries uh, have no AI and no technologies and all the jobs are gone and they're so poor and they go into uh, this um, e either a very uh, a rogue state that uh, tries to endanger others and uh, that joblessness can cause these things. Also, carelessness uh, and malicious programming of AI can also hurt humanity. Uh, for, for example, um, uh, autonomous weapons. One could imagine how, how, how dangerous they could be. Autonomous vehicles, uh, let's say they became pervasive and someone hacked it. Uh, it could be turned around not to miss human but to hit humans and one country or one set of terrorists can completely not just disable but almost destroy a country because all the vehicles might be hacked. So those kinds of issues I think are real and we have to be cautious um, on how to get there. I am hopeful that this utopian world is one day possible, probably more for two, three generations from now. Uh, we, if we get over those existential issues in the next one or one and a half generations. Um, I do think AI can eventually do not only the routine tasks, but more. And I think they will become more and more capable. 
and they will increase the profitability, reduce the costs, and, and uh, basically inject a huge amount of value into our global GDP. And, um, and that we will one day look back and see this removal of routine jobs, not as a cruelty, but as, as uh, something that uh, frees us from having to do routine tasks and really spend time on what we love to do with our loved ones, on the hobbies that we love, uh, inventing new things, thinking about the meaning of life. So I, I'm, I'm certainly more with the utopians, but I think we got to solve a lot of the problems that emerge. Well, thank you on that. And um, do you think that there should be limits on the use of artificial intelligence? You mentioned the use of AI in terms of autonomous weapons, where autonomous weapons make decisions about targets and who to kill, <clears throat> and maybe even in the area of, say, criminal sentencing, you have an AI algorithm that determines uh, how long of a sentence and uh, whether or not to parole an individual. Should decisions about life and liberty be allowed to be made by computers? Well, I'm pretty sure we'll get a unanimous, unanimous answer from this audience, and I would tend to agree with that. There are many limits that we have to set, but it's, it's, it's actually very, very tricky because I think, I, I think all of us can agree we should um, seriously regulate autonomous weapons. We should be extremely cautious and perhaps not in our lifetimes see machine sentencing people. Um, however, it's kind of a gray area because you certainly don't want machine to sentence someone to death, but what about the machine to settle a, um, a small claims dispute or maybe a traffic ticket? And then you go into a slippery slope. Where do you stop, right? So I think that's not a black and white uh, issue. Uh, and also, I want to emphasize that different cultures will be a little bit different uh, in the ways they view this. Um, I would say uh, China, I think, is generally speaking more utilitarian. That is looking at the greater good and the ultimate answer and not f as focused on individuals. For example, um, uh, there is already a sentencing assistant that's active in Chinese courts. AI is telling the judge these, this is the kind of sentencing that would probably be appropriate. The judge makes the decision, but you got to believe the tool is influencing the judge. Right. Right. And then in autonomous uh, vehicles, people in the US, especially Europe, love to debate the trolley problem. Right. Uh, would you hit three children or throw the owner over a cliff? Right. Th those kind of issues. And uh, some car manufacturers already said, are saying, we protect the driver <laughs> or, or the owner. So it's good this for is business. Good for business, but it's going to be very challenging uh, debate. But in China, I think those will not be so much debated. Uh, my guess is the government will say uh, the greater good is for fewer lives to be lost. Therefore, if an AI is launched that is proven to be better in general than people, then let's let the algorithm run. And then with more data, it will get even better, and eventually so many lives will be saved, then the early um, um, lives lost may be worth it. It's not additional lives lost, keep in mind. However, um, I think people in the United States may have a lot of trouble with, let's say, you know, 100,000 people are killed today. We have a new AI algorithm that would only, uh, through traffic accidents. Uh, we have a new algorithm that would only cause 90,000 to be killed. Uh, but it's a different 90,000. Uh, <laughs> right? Of course it is. So if you're one of the, uh, if you're one of the 90,000, you're going to be angry with all kinds of lawsuits. And if you're one of the 100,000, you would never know because you, because the machines have taken over. So in a system where legal disputes and, uh, and, and fight for individual liberty is so strong, how do you ever get the system going from 100,000 to 90,000? Because in the future, it will be 50,000 and 10,000. So I think we can all agree 10,000 is going to be worth it. But if you don't accept it at 90,000, you may never get to 10,000. That's a paradox for, for this society. Well, it's 
It's interesting. Uh, you mentioned in your discussions how um, in sentencing or in medicine, there will be an AI algorithm <clears throat> and maybe the human might interface with the machine and provide the final decision, the final authority. Do you worry that if I'm the human being and this AI computer has poured through all the data and returns a result that this is the diagnosis or this is the sentence that as a human being, due to liability concerns, I'm not very likely to jump in and circumvent the recommendation of the computer mm. for fear of liability, yeah. for fear of, you know, the computer looked at all the data, surely it must be right. So in essence, there is no intervention. That's right. I, I, but you're the expert on this issue. Well, so, <laughs> so I guess your AI systems just have to be better, is what you're saying. Well, the thing is, they're going, they're going to be eventually better by far, but initially, maybe only better by a little. So the problem is merely transitory. Uh, but, but getting over that yeah. hump is going to be tough. Yeah. Right. OK, let's, let's turn to another topic. I got a question here about jobs. Um, you had mentioned 10% loss of jobs. You also mentioned that within 15 years in the United States, 40 to 50% of the jobs in the United States will be automated by some form of AI. Right. I, what I said is technically replaceable. Technically, technically and economically replaceable. Okay. It may not happen due to, you know, the CEO feeling um, a, a loyalty to the employees or government regulations or labor unions. So it's hard for me to estimate those things. But technically and economically, yes. So how do you see that unfolding? Who will be the winners and losers in terms of jobs, job gains and job losses? And what, if anything, do you think the government should do to help soften the blow? Right. So I think the jobs lost will be the routine jobs. So that includes some examples I've given, assembly line workers, um, fruit pickers, dishwashers, uh, but also white collar jobs. For example, um, uh, customer service representatives and uh, telemarketing, telesales, um, um, and, and also expanding to some um, pretty high-end jobs like radiologists. Uh, but uh, but th more detail in the book. But basically, these are the routine aspects of those jobs will be replaced. Those are the ones lost. And in aggregate, it's probably not hard to convince yourself that at least 50% of human jobs are scripted repetitions of similar things. And, and especially those quantitatively oriented, very easily replaced. What jobs will be gained? Well, clearly AI will create a bunch of jobs, and we probably don't even know what those jobs are. And that is probably the best, the best news. And that's what a lot of people would argue, every technology revolution always ends up creating more jobs than destroying them. But I do think there's a difference in this case because AI is coming too fast. Um, and also it's run with dual engine, US and China. And also the replacement aren't always one to one but sometimes through disruptions. Um, by inventing a, a robotic restaurants, uh, McDonald's will lose jobs, right? By having, ro by, by having a Facebook newsfeed, traditional media will lose editors, not because they hired the robot to do the editor, but because the traditional industry got squeezed. So, so I think the losses will be substantial. And then the AI creation of jobs, we have no way of telling how many there will be. I actually believe in human wisdom. Given enough time, maybe three generations, I think AI will create more jobs than it destroys. But AI will happen so fast that this may not be the case. So what, what can be done? Um, I would call on a different dimension. If you want uh, to make creative jobs, AI jobs, you know, robot repair, AI programmer, data scientist, it's very hard to train for them, educate for them, not to mention taking someone in a routine job, making them a data scientist. That just isn't practical. But what, what may be practical is another dimension, which is jobs that require human touch, human compassion, human empathy. Uh, jobs like nurses, elderly care, tourist guide, uh, concierge, uh, jobs like the future of doctors, the ner um, nannies. So these are the types of jobs that can be large enough in number and also require modest amount of retraining so that um, the reskilling could happen. Take an ex as an example, elderly care. Uh, I understand there are a million positions open in the U.S., 
but they're not filled because the pay is too low. So what can governments do? To give a very simple example, a lot of people talk about universal basic income, which says basically tax the ultra-rich and give money to everybody. I would argue that's a very terrible idea. It fixes the uh, income redistribution problem, but it doesn't fix the individual's loss of meaning problem. When you lose your job, you don't just want to get social welfare and treat you as the so-called useless class that some author has chosen to use, which I think is terrible. Um, but you really need to, I think peop many people today need to find meaning in having a job. And, uh, and so why don't someone who lost a job, a customer service job, why don't they want to be an elderly care person? It's because the job doesn't pay enough. So some policy that, that basically adjusts the elderly care pay would be a much better way to spend the tax from the ultra-rich than to give money to everybody. Now, what is the policy? Again, you're the expert. I don't know what policy that should be, but there must be some way to inject um, money into care, re-education, social value. It's kind of questioning the social contract we have today. I mean, our social contract is that we are paid based on the economic value and economic value only that we contribute to the society. And what this is saying is maybe there are other elements to consider. Maybe we can be paid based on some combination of economic and social benefit that we bring about. So technical engineering and social engineering needed. Yes, both. All right. Let's turn to privacy. Okay. Our privacy is increasingly under siege these days. <clears throat> there seems to be a trade-off on the one hand between privacy and the power of an AI system. The more comprehensive the data collected, the more powerful and the more intelligent the AI system, but also the more exposed our privacy. So if you look at a spectrum, we've got Europe, on the one side, with the GDPR, General Data Protection Regulations, providing some of the strongest protections uh, in the world. And I think it's fair to say that China's at the other end, yeah. with the US somewhere in between, mm -hmm. possibly closer to China, but having a lot of angst mm. as to where is the proper place to play along that spectrum. Do you think China's less restrictive privacy environment gives it a competitive advantage in terms of the power of its mm. systems? Yeah, I, I think this is sometimes a little bit misunderstood. Um, what you say is not incorrect, but it's a little bit misunderstood. Uh, because every time someone says Chinese people don't care about privacy, they get blasted in Chinese social media. <laughs> so I don't dare make that statement anymore. Uh, so certainly the Chinese people think they care a lot about privacy. I think the issue, however, I think they have not been educated in this kind of environment to know exactly what rights to fight for. So I think over time, the increasing privacy will happen in China. It's just that that hasn't historically uh, been something people have been aware of. So um, I, I, I think it is, for the user standpoint, it is a trade-off between privacy and security and convenience. So by giving up some privacy, you let yourself be monitored and protected against you know, bad people. Is that something you would do? On the other hand, there's privacy for convenience. By letting the big companies have more of our data, your user experience is better. You save money. Is that worth it? So I think Europe's GDPR is an attempt to give people back a little bit of control in those two dials. Um, and I think GDPR is, is quite clumsy in the way it's designed now, but I, I applaud Europe for doing it because at least it shows something should be done. Uh, China actually has done something, um, and uh, what's done is uh, basically it, um, preventing a company who's collected a lot of data from selling it or giving it to someone else with extreme penalties similar to GDPR, also extreme penalties. And so if you look at that, well, the, what's, the, what's the biggest privacy issue that's upset the Americans? It must have been the Facebook Cambridge Analytica issue, right? And that was the case of one entity giving, or giving data to another entity without the consent of the individuals. So actually that case would have been 
either prevented in China or punished very severely with imprisonment. So I think each country is trying something different. Um, and I, I, I do believe, uh, so finally, the last point is I, I do agree that because more data makes better AI, um, if privacy gives users the right to not give the data, then the AI will not be as good. So a society or government has to measure the impact of the economic impact of creating very strict laws that makes the AI work less well. Let me take a question here. Do you foresee a future where the United States and China are collaborating on AI <coughs> advancement? Maybe that's already occurring. Mm -hmm. And if so, how? Um, it is occurring at academic levels. Um, you know, um, uh, when I did my PhD thesis on speech recognition, the data was all shared by National Institute of Standards and Technologies. And um, um, Carnegie Mellon decided to, and I decided to open source our, our code. And that kind of began uh, AI becoming a very open and sharing community. Uh, people are publishing in real time um, uh, and also sharing data in real time and often sharing source code. So when all that sharing happens, it helps move the whole field forward. So, um, so someone who published a great result may be challenged, and then knowing that, he or she is likely to be more honest. AI is a science where uh, the same data going in should yield the same result, unlike many of the other natural sciences. So these natural aspects made the whole world very much connected. If you go visit uh, one of the big conferences like CVPR or NIPS or ICASP, you will see every country, researchers from every country, very openly sharing, discussing, talking. There are no national boundaries, no competition of superpowers. So that sharing is going on whether or not the other competition goes on. So that I see. Um, I also see, I also hope the governments will work together on things like restricting autonomous weapons, on things like agreeing on general principles about um, security and privacy. Um, maybe not agreeing on the final outcome, but general principles. And I also hope that com uh, countries will share best practices on how to adjust our social contract, because that is such a hard task that um, I think there are great things various countries do, like, um, in, um, for example, in Korea, the gifted and talented education may be something to be shared. In Japan and Switzerland, the, um, the, the types of craftsmanship and that being a great career path, that may be something that could be shared. Uh, in Canada and the Netherlands, the volunteerism, maybe that's something that could be shared. So I do hope more countries will share. And in, in terms of sharing best practices, it's not limited to superpowers. Every country has some good, good ideas to share. So you can foresee uh, international effort to define, for example, AI values, AI ethics, and so forth. I, I certainly hope so. There are some institutions like Partnership for AI is trying to do that. UN may be doing something, um, but I think in practice, e even without the current um, push to nationalism, each country, I think, is going to be more independent in how it makes decisions. So the cross-country bodies will have really only limited powers. Okay, I have an interesting question for you, Kaifu. Mm -hmm. How will AI affect the fields involved with human sensories, such as taste, food, and smell, for example, wines. Will a computer be able to select your favorite wine from California? Um, I, I don't know. I have not studied okay, that. Okay, fair enough, we fair are, enough. We're a, we a VC, so we focus <laughs> on things with economic value. There may be a startup for you yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. I, I imagine some sensor can probably do something. Sure. Uh, right. But I just don't know how far it can get. Interesting, okay, fair enough. Um, you said that one company, like Google, won't be able to acquire all data of the society, but how about a nation like China? This comes up a lot. Um, I, think, I think there is a belief that the Chinese government collects all the data and uses it. 
it is absolutely untrue. <laughs> it's impossible to collect, and it's um, and actually no government at this point AI expertise is definitely in the private sector. So the the task of doing that is is just too too large. So I I think that is perhaps based on uh, paranoia and fear and concerns about, um, about China rather than based on uh, anything that's realistically likely to happen. Fair enough. Uh, in terms of artificial general intelligence, do we need a paradigm shift from deep neural nets to achieve a true general intelligence? I think there's general agreement that we would that deep learning is um, uh, very well understood and engineered and ready for applications, and it's going to continue to build us those wonderful narrow prodigies, and that it may be a part of the future AGI, uh, but it's certainly not the only part. Um, but again, I want to say that AGI may be impossible. So AGI, I know that a lot of researchers are optimistic that AGI is possible, and many have projected 10 or 15 years uh, on the realization of AGI. But when you drill down, uh, they can't give you a roadmap. So AGI meaning the ability of a computer or machine to perform all the functions that a human being That's right. can perform in terms of intelligence. That's right. And, and sometimes they forget that all the things we perform includes our love, our soul, our emotions. All right? and, and no one has any idea how to do that. And even if you throw that away and just say, build an analytical human, um, but then there's strategy and planning and creativity and inventions. We still don't know how to do that. There are some very basic things like common sense that AI doesn't even have. And, uh, <laughs> it, it really doesn't, has no, no clue. So I would say we're farther away than 10 or 15 years. Uh, I think a lot of researchers tend to be just a little bit uh, optimistic. Okay, um, why did you decide to write this book? I decided to write it because I found many of the other books to be um, inaccurate uh, and misleading. Uh, not completely, each book of course has its merits, but um, I found um, some books have incorrect technical understanding, especially the ones that project uh, singularity, AGI, and superintelligence. I feel that's dangerous to believe. I also think um, some books um, inject a strong sense of negativity by calling the future of 90% um, of our people to be in useless class. I think it's um, an, uh, an unfair insult. It's, um, it's uh, insulting to our humanity and equality, and I think it injects a negativity that can become self-fulfilling prophecy. And also, um, those were my thoughts when I approached my uh, book agent and publisher, or, or they approached me. But they said, that's not going to sell a book. Uh, he, says, uh, he says, you know, historians and philosophers write better than you do. And, and that's probably true. But, but he said, here's what you can do. If you can put China in the book, that's going to sell. <laughs> so, so I thought there was, a, there, there was an angle. Because he said, you're the old China expert. No one can write like you. You're an AIG expert, China expert. Put them in the book. Does it fit? <laughs> so so if, if the book reads like two books, I, I deeply apologize. <laughs> <laughs> OK, fair enough. Um, you write a lot in your book, uh, Kaifu, about how China had a Sputnik moment mm. and how the government took very concerted steps to develop and promote mm. uh, the advancement of technological innovation and in particular artificial intelligence. Um, share with the audience a little bit about that and the question, uh, the reason I'm asking that question is this particular uh, audience member says, how can Europe reach the same level of AI knowledge and economy like China and US? So those two mm. questions might be related. Okay. So the first question is on the, um, the role of Chinese government. Uh, first, I want to say that AI pretty much took off in the private sector. Uh, the, the government noticed it about two years ago. Uh, and that Sputnik moment was when AlphaGo beat Lee Sedo, the Korean expert. And that shocked Chinese because all the AI experts, including me, have been saying, you know, Go is a game that 
we don't expect machines to beat people for another 15 years, and suddenly it happened. Also, Go is an ancient Chinese game that Chinese invented, and it's believed to be more than intelligence. But there's Zen and you know, and, and you know, human insight, brilliance, philosophy. It's like it's one of the things that 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 were represented the Chinese art and 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 all that. And suddenly, this U.S. U.K. company jumped in and beat the best. And while most of America didn't even see those matches because you, most of you don't play Go, but in, in China, 100 million people watched, and that really woke people up. A little bit like the Sputnik moment uh, did for America when USSR um, uh, launched it. So, uh, so the Chinese government woke up and made a lot of very decisive and I think smart steps. So the point I want to make is that it really began in the private sector. Government is secondary. However, having said that, the, the secondary government aspects are very, very strong and very helpful and very effective and very worthy of studying by US and Europe. Uh, now, the government's support for AI is not what you read in media, especially the anti-China media. Uh, that basically says, okay, the Chinese government blocks foreign companies from entering, injects money into Chinese companies so that with a lower cost they can beat American companies. I'm not saying those things have not been true in the past in certain cases, but that is not how Chinese government um, uh, basically superscaled AI. Here's what Chinese government did. There are three things that they did that were very instructive and maybe a little hard to replicate, but, but you need to know what they are. Uh, I think first is, a, um, is infrastructure building. Um, and, and basically, let the private enterprise do the investment, entrepreneurship, products, customers, and all that. But there are things that private sector cannot do, such as building roads. And what are roads for AI? These are autonomous vehicle roads. These are new highways that uh, have sensors to help cars be, uh, be safer. And building a new city. China is building a new city called Xiong'an. It is the size of Chicago. And it will have autonomous vehicle built in. It, the Chinese cities are also very entrepreneurial. A city called Suzhou is building a 10 square kilometer piece of land where one, one layer is purely uh, autonomous vehicle, another is human vehicle. And another example is where two layers of downtown are being built. The top layer is for people, bicycles, and pets. And the bottom is for vehicles, including autonomous vehicle, but with controlled lighting so that the Tesla ac accidents cannot happen. It was, it was really uh, lighting and color and things like that that confused the car into thinking the truck was sky, right? So all these, it's, a, it's an entrepreneurial uh, uh, environment where huge amounts of money went into infrastructure. Now, some of you might be saying, hey, that's unfair. Uh, that's like indirectly helping. But when President Eisenhower built the U.S. interstate highway, it had the same, same effect, right, for a different age. So I think that's what governments should do, is infrastructure building, leave everything to private, else to private. That's number one. Uh, the number two is a general techno-utilitarian policy. This may be hard to emulate, I'm not, and I, it may not be right, but it, for every case. Techno-utilitarian policy in China means when a new technology comes around, just to give it a shot. Don't regulate and block it, and watch it. And if it's something it goes wrong, let's regulate it. If it goes really terribly, let's stop it. That, whereas US and Europe will tend to want to debate all the, all the, all the possible outcomes and regulate it before it comes out. An example is Chinese mobile payment. In a short period of three years, China now has no cash and no credit cards. When I say no, I mean very small percentage. I don't carry cash or credit cards when I go out. It's all mobile pay. And mobile pay today is 700 million people paying, who can pay each other instantly with no commission. Not, no, you know, as you know, credit card charges 2 or 3% at the merchant side. This is no commission at either the merchant or the user side. Um, th there is a 1.1% transaction fee for taking money out of your bank, but that's a very much smaller amount. And, uh, and it's micropayment capable, so you can give somebody 15 cents. So that came about because you know, 
Tencent and Alibaba did some mobile payment, and the government obviously had concerns. Obviously, credit card companies and banks don't like it, but the government basically said, let's just go ahead and see if it goes well. Can they do it securely? And they did. Now it's taken over by storm. There were other things that worked less well. Um, for example, P2P lending. That caused a certain amount of fraud, and the government now is, is regulating it after letting it go out. And cryptocurrency. That led to a huge amount of money laundering, and the government didn't know what to do uh, to, to regulate it, so they stopped it altogether. So it's not that China is letting all technology go loose. They're just letting it go out a little bit, try it, and then regulate it um, uh, only on an as-needed as needed basis. So these are the types of things that uh, um, the, the, the Chinese government does. And, and there's one other thing I should say. It's setting, uh, and that relates to the form of government. It's basically setting a tone. So when the central government issues a plan, actually you've probably all read this or heard about this manufacturing 2025. There's also an AI 2030. Those plans are very ambitious and target driven. But actually the central government doesn't have all the say and the budget. It's about setting a tone. Because it is run top down as a government, when they set a tone, when the AI document came out, our AI investment, we have an AI investment building AI for banking. They were having trouble op opening doors to banks. But when the AI document came out, the bank said, we better do AI. So suddenly we're, they were, able, we were able to sell the software into the banks. So the setting a tone by the central government is important, but it is not like what you read in the media. It is not like the central government has $600 billion and is giving it to Chinese companies. Uh, our companies uh, basically got nearly nothing from the government. I mean, we, have, we currently have five unicorns valued at about $23 billion that we invested in. And none of them were funded by the government. All of them were pri privately funded that generated revenues and rose to, to their um, success by themselves. Uh, maybe after success, government would give them some free rent or something, but it's in inconsequential. Interesting. So AI will affect the tax revenue. Since robots are not currently taxed and currently human beings who provide labor earn income, which is taxed in the form of income tax. Uh, Bill Gates says that we should tax the robots. Um, others say that a tax on automation is a tax on innovation and progress, and we didn't do so in the Industrial <coughs> Revolution, so why should we do so now? Mm. Your thoughts on how our governments can keep the lights on and provide the services that, that they need if there's a decrease in income tax, a major source of revenue for the government. Right. Well, I can't believe that govern, former government official keeps asking me policy questions. <laughs> and I'm an engineer and investor. But nevertheless, I will try. <laughs> um, I, I certainly think redistribution is absolutely needed. If you just look at even without AI for the last 15 or 20 years, uh, the American disparity between the top 1% and the bottom 50% have not only crossed each other, but continue to increase. The gap is widening the wealth held by the top 1% and the wealth held by the bottom 50%. And that is very much a result of uh, the ultra-rich um, from tech in the past, maybe internet, mobile, and so on. In the future, AI companies. And in the AI, it's going to be double jeopardy because job displacements will, will make the bottom 50 even more challenged. And the routine jobs are largely uh, um, correlated with the bottom 50%. So that rapidly, uh, increasingly widening gap must be closed. And I wish we, we had some ma magical formula other than tax to close them. but. But at a dire time like this, I think we got to use um, approaches that are proven for centuries to work, and tax is the only one. Uh, but rather than taxing specifically AI companies or robot companies, I don't think it's possible to do, right? I'm a board member of Foxconn, uh, where the robots are. And the Foxconn margins are this much compared to Apple's margins. <laughs> so please tax <laughs> Apple, not Foxconn. <laughs> you know, uh, um, and and I think also you know 
targeting AI companies. Who's a target AI company? I think in five, AI is like the internet. Today, there are a bunch of AI companies. I think in five years, there will be no more AI companies. Every company will have its own AI. It's just like internet. So I think, I don't think you can do it by classes. And, and I think, you know, again, let's not invent something when we really need to do this income redistribution and um, taxes based on, I think taxing the ultra rich is the easiest way. I mean, occasionally there will be a collateral damage of a, <laughs> of a very rich person who had no AI, but we'll take their money never, anyway. Okay. So I see we've got the signal for the last question because we're running out to the, to the last few minutes here. And as moderator, I'm going to exercise my moderator uh, prerogative and ask you the following question. On the very last page, the very last paragraph of your book, Kaifu, you write, luckily, as human beings, we possess free will to choose our own goals that AI still lacks. We can choose to come together, working across class boundaries and national borders to write our own ending to the AI story. Let us choose to let machines be machines and let humans be humans. Let us choose to simply use our machines and more importantly, to love one another. Yes. Any further thoughts? You gave away the ending. <laughs> <laughs> well, they have to yeah. read all of it in I order know. to get how you get, uh, how you get there. I'm just kidding. Uh, yes, I, I, I think I feel very strongly about that because I think as you've heard, I, I really don't like some of the books that are so dystopian. And, and uh, I believe a thought leader has a responsibility of leading people towards good outcomes because what thought leaders say may become self-fulfilling prophecy. So if, if someone writes a book and says, most of you are useless class, it's hopeless, AI is gonna take over, what's going to happen? People are gonna work less, they'll be depressed, and even though this may not be the end, this will be the end because pe if people believe that kind of saying. And, and if, we, if, we, if we believed, and in, in my book, I clearly uh, point out there are ways in which if that the, a very interesting side effect or maybe the actual outcome is that our maker um, or our collective consciousness, if you don't believe in, uh, if you're not religious, uh, has in mind um, we have been trapped in this industrial revolution driven work equals meaning of life. And we're just repetitively, routinely doing work, thinking that if I work harder, even if it's repetitive work, it will give, my, it will give meaning to my life and give my better living to my family. While that is understandable, that cannot be why humans were placed on this earth. And I think if there were a maker, uh, he would be disappointed looking at humanity, that after you know, thousands of years, all we do is repeat routine work and thinking that's the meaning of our lives. And he has not been able to make us wiser, so he brought in AI. <laughs> so AI takes away all the routine jobs. Okay, now you humans, can you please figure out why you exist? <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this evening's program brought to you by the Committee of 100 and the Commonwealth Club Silicon Valley. Again, we would like to thank Kai-Fu Lee, author of AI Superpowers, China, Silicon Valley, and the New World Order. The Honorable Michelle Lee, former Under Secretary of Commerce and Director of the United States Patent and Trade Office. Our audience here in Silicon Valley and those of you who are joining us on the radio and web. And now, this meeting is adjourned.